you have worked very, very hard and you earned a lot of money and now you want to buy a true luxury car. Maybe the most luxurious one of all. Really? This year is the all new Lexus LM. It's related to the Toyota Alphard and Lexus claims that this one is more luxurious than a luxury sedan. Like a Mercedes S-Class, BMW 7 Series or Audi A8. But is it true? We're going to find out with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with this front, which is... I mean, this is like... I can't really say it's screaming out because it's more than screaming out. And it's not that it would need such a large cooling. They just made this one design-wise on purpose that way here. I usually never say that a car is ugly because it's always a matter of taste or preference. But in this case, I really have to say this is beyond ugly. I just have to say that. Sorry, Lexus. But it's just fact, isn't it? Or is there anyone out there who likes this one design-wise? Would be really curious. However, don't cancel the ride yet because this vehicle is really super unique and interesting. It has things on the interior I've never seen before and I'll take you all the way through that. First of all, on the exterior, 17-inch wheels or these ones here. These are 19-inch wheels forged. 5 meter 13 or 202 inches is the length and this typical MPV style. 3 meters in wheelbase, so really long wheelbase indeed. And you can see also the height and just straight lines. This vehicle will be all about form for this function that you have more space on the inside. And technology wise, you will also get by standard an adaptive suspension, the AVS by Lexus. So really looking forward how that behaves driving myself and also being driven today. In the rear here, the light strip goes all the way through. And this is also the all-wheel drive version. How does it work? There's an electric motor at the rear axle, but it's only being activated when there is traction loss. So in the acceleration figure, it's 9.1 versus 8.7 seconds. If you compare front-wheel drive to the all-wheel drive version, all-wheel drive is standard for the EU market. So when you really float down, even then just a little bit, it's more in situations, maybe like there's an icy road or something, and then the front axle loses traction, then more at the rear axle is being activated. Anyone? <laughs> Turning any gears in the front? Well, that one looks quite fancy. In the rear? Ah, this split here, interesting, so that the outside can stay even when the hatch is opened. And here is a contrast for you, a darker color, this super dark gray, almost black. In this case, of course, here the chrome accentuations are even more prominent when the vehicle color is black. So tell me, which one do you find more beautiful? As for the interior, today we we'll start at the rear because that is a special thing and you've never seen it. Oh, umbrella holders. I wanted to say you have never seen it before. First of all, it's a huge handle to get inside and this is like a first class aircraft. Look at that. Wow. Hardly have ever seen something in a car and you know that reaching. Look at the other side. That a just black field, it looks like. This is a 48-inch screen. We're gonna take a look at that very soon. Oh, and here in this lower part, look inside. Whoops. Yeah, look at that. This here is an actual fridge. <laughs> That's also funny, right? And you have the seat controls right here in the manual way, but you can also use smartphones here for the seat control. And of course, the most interesting thing is, I'm doing it manually now, this fold flat function. I'm doing it parallel here now on the right and the left side. Look at that. And it goes even further. And then you can use the full potential of this vehicle. Look at that in this four-seater version here. It goes all the way flat in that way. Wow. And now we can, of course, also put the front one up. The alternative would be the six or seven-seater version. We're soon going to compare that one. And here, now the front goes up. That looks spectacular, right? And here with 189 or 6 for 2 in this four-seater version, I also have enough space that I can really stretch my legs out and now can ah, begin to nap. Wow, that's actually pretty cool. And 
Recently we had the Mercedes V-Class in this S-Class van edition and there it was that the seat were not going that flat and you were kind of like sliding forward even in that sleeping position. Here you do not slide forward clearly. If I want to drive while being in that position, I gotta, I gotta see about that later in the driving part. But I doubt, I doubt. And um, crash safety wise, probably might also be better to be a little bit more upright. Um, there is not one single hard button available where you can directly fold everything flat. You can, for example, work you with the smartphone memory or so. But there's one key here available or one button which resets the position back to normal. I think, you know, in these luxury sedans, there is usually one button, one hard button, or at least something in the, in the menu directly where I can fold everything flat and another one then, or push the same one to go back again. Yeah, I think the one that goes all the way flat button, that one is missing in here, but it is super interesting. It, when you're sitting down here, you don't believe that you would be in a car actually. And um, here, this, this split window at the moment, it's open. I can access, you know, as you like, slap the driver <laughs> from here. Um, but we can actually also control it from here. First of all, I can put the glass up and down like this. And then there's also possible that we, you know, have this, this, this shading electrochromic effect. There we go. That's super imp impressive and it works immediately. You can do that from both sides, from here, but the driver can actually also do that. And then, even more controls, we can electronically lower the window here. And you see it also has this tinting, so not so much sun rays come inside. And then there's the huge storage area here. And there you can actually also connect the HDMI devices to this large screen. Furthermore, you can also take out these smartphones here and <laughs> use them for parallel seat controlling. And I can also lower these side shades to make it even darker here and here. So that looks also quite fancy. By the way, here on the side, there's another cubby hole. You can also put your smartphone here, USB-C charging. Yeah, and let's, let's put this shade up again. So that looks really spectacular. Huge handle again. And here in the roof, I also have the roof shade controls. That looks also really fancy, right? Leah discovered one more feature for us here. So I also have this top mirror here and actually on both sides as well. Well, that looks very elegant. I mean both her and the car. And here, some more tables to fold out each side again. Oh, and in the front each, everyone gets a small glove box. This here is the most powerful well, electric and here we can then <laughs> watch this cinematic screen with the competition. Let me tune down the volume a little bit. So at the moment you can see here I can't use all the screen here because you need the fitting format for it. But it looks actually quite cool. Yeah, putting down the volume here is a little bit complicated, I have to say. You can also adjust it here. This would be the full button, then you know the aspect ratio is actually not working this little bit better than twin mode would actually be that you can have different content left and right. Yeah, or <laughs> in this case both uh, the same. Definitely super impressive to have such a screen in Vega and the, like the image quality and so on is really crisp. At the moment I have my laptop connected via HDMI. And here what's also possible, HDMI to lightning adapter or then USB-C for the all new iPhone or for Android phones. Then you can also play your content from your phone. Of course, this then also works with streaming. When I have like streaming service, Netflix, whatever on my phone, then have the adapter connected and then I can also stream it on the screen because that vertical format doesn't make too much sense here. Have you ever had the problem that you smashed yourself in the face with the rear hatch because you were standing behind the vehicle and then you were opening that huge hatch can happen especially with MPVs. Not here because the opening mechanism is also here at each side of the vehicle and then I can press this button and there we go and it's opening. Takes a while but then can I stand underneath it with 189 or 6 foot 2? Here yes, 
here no. <laughs> and then let's take a look at the loading area here of the four seater, soon also comparison, comparison of the six or seven seater. The width here is uh, like more than 120 in meters or 47 inches. And you can see here a set of luggage, no problem at all. And the cool thing is that the loading floor here is quite even and very low. That makes loading in and out actually fairly easy. And the length here is some 70 centimeters or 28 inches. And I found this cubbyhole interesting. That's here for the decor number plates. So hide the number plates underneath it, the fake number plates, you know, when fleeing for the police and you just pick the other one. <laughs> and this is also a very nice picnic idea. I mean, when you open the rear hatch, and use this one then here as a sun view or something. <laughs> However, there is a big problem with these electric seats that fall down. You see here, there's not much space left and you really have to pay attention. Like this, it does work and the backpacks in between or so. But these seats, when you put them down, they will not stop. There's no sensor, there's nothing uh, that holds them from going down. And I already broke half of my suitcase now because it, it stood a little bit more upright uh, and so the seat just crashed the suitcase. Now let's check out the six or seven seater version, which will be some 25,000 euros or dollars less expensive. What is different here? First of all, there's no split then to the front cabin. And there's also just a smaller screen, like a 14 inch screen for the rear seat entertainment. Then the seats itself here in the second row, are more or less the same. So you have some less applications on the side armrests each, but the inside of the seat and the comfort is definitely comparable. Of course, they don't build two different seats for that. So when I'm just sitting here, you have the same base comfort. However, there's one limitation that is, well, I can put this also here, this is rear seat, back part behind, and you can also put the footrest up. Doesn't it work simultaneously here? No, obviously not. So first of all here, all this seat back. So, and then the footrest up. And now, of course, there's the problem. I have this seat all the way back on the slider already. And then when I put the footrest all the way in, it's not possible for me then with my legs. So I, I cannot, you see here, it doesn't really work lengthwise with my legs. That's the main limitation here. If you would be way smaller than me, then it would still work, however. And you can also see that this whole setup now is not entirely flat. And then let's check out the third seating row here in the six or seven seater. Slide this one forward electronically. And then there's here this manual folding mechanism for the upper part. Then you can take a look at that already. And now you see why people always say six or seven seat because the outside seats are full. So you rather say six plus one because in the middle part, you only see the head restraint, <laughs> but it is theoretically possible, but not really meant for long distance. So let me get inside. So, and then having here the rear seat, it's also very soft and plush and so on. So the outside seats are also very comfortable, also fits headroom wise, no problem at all. And the seat belts on the outsides each. And here the middle part is a little bit stiffer. It is also somewhat possible and the seat belt for that is hidden here in the ceiling. Um, yeah, and then you have to imagine when there would be like three Thomas next to each other, um, it might be a little bit too wide then. So th that's why then six plus one, the emergency seat here with this very interesting head restraint right there. And now, of course, another difference is the trunk. Let's now check out the trunk or the boot here of the six or seven seater. And now it gets even more particularly funny. So this here, that way, third seating row, no space at all, basically, just a little bit. But I can actually move them down or up. How do I mean that? First of all here, folding that one down like this. And now I have never seen this. <laughs> Look at that. So I fold them up like this and then I'm being helped a little bit here by the vehicle and so there we go, we secure them each here on the left side and I do the same also on the right side and then it opens up everything here, 1,190 liters. So the most space that is possibly available. Yeah, I've never seen such a strange setup, but it definitely works. And then you have the same flat floor basically. Here, by the way, to secure some umbrellas is another, uh, let's say, third party idea. <laughs> well, the practical thing here with the rear compartment and this 
glass window, Leah can film me very well now that we can see the cockpit from there. And there we go, typical Lexus cockpit layout, 14 inch screen, you can see the CarPlay integration. Also go to the Lexus menu right here or to the driving modes and so on. And still somewhat physical buttons at the screen. So they're kind of attached on the screen. This is like a very nice mix between a haptical feedback or tactile feeling here and the screen. Also here for the volume knob. Typical steering wheel, electric in and out, up and down. And we have some matte wood atmosphere here in the lower part, for example. And these are then the controls for the glass. And I can also apply this shade there. Digital instruments, you also have some setup possibilities here, so you can change it a little bit to, to your liking. The driver can open and close the doors from here, left next to the steering wheel. And very useful here to use the digital camera mirror, so when everything is closed, like the split glass in between and so on, you can still see the rear. Infotainment system, wireless Apple CarPlay is possible, or wired and Android Auto only wired. Lexus system itself, it also has a car internal GPS, but of course Google Maps and Apple Maps would be better overall. And here, for example, hotkey to the driving modes, we'll test also later. Seat heating, seat cooling need to be activated here inside the infotainment. Shift Neva has this rather old school step system way. Then cup holders, adaptive. And then you have a two side opening way, large box for all the clutter. Very comfortable front seating position as well, and with 189 or 602, plenty of headroom left. Animal skin only for today's vehicle. They also need to offer animal free alternatives. This is the key fob here, and then door closing sound. Oh, actually, quite interesting. But this one also in the front here has a soft close. Mmm, magic. And now we'll have a small break because the battery has just died on us. You have to admit, this, what we do here, is a special use case. We show all of the features and they are all electric consumers. However, this happened to me now, I think, three or four times and only in Toyota and Lexus vehicles of the newest generation. So most obviously, the electric consumers, together with that 12 volt battery size, is not enough obviously so and you have to think about even if we do the tests now they are also normal customers who maybe leave the lights on you know uh, for some time or also being stationary and do some electric things here especially with this vehicle here or maybe you go camping and then use of the electric consumers without having the engine running and that is obviously at this moment not possible with Toyota and Lexus vehicles of the recent generation so this is a warning then to you if you use some electric consumers for some time, you have to leave the engine running, otherwise the battery will die on you. And also we have to differentiate, this has nothing to do with some bad reliability or something. Still, Toyota and Lexus scored the best reliability ranking or figures usually in most of the tests and you can applaud them for that. But obviously there is a problem with, you know, maybe not well dimensioned or something, battery or that the current new electric consumers just consume too much energy for that battery size. Now we have to wait for someone with a booster to get the battery up to date again to, uh, for some power. And um, what do we do with this vast interior space in this mm. van vehicle now when we still have half an hour left until the guys come? Engines, this here 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine, inbuilt hybrid system, typically from Toyota, four cylinder, inline four cylinder, and then for Europe, that rear axle electric motor for the all drive is also standard. In some other markets like China and Japan, you can also get a 2.4 turbo hybrid that is then a little bit stronger. This one here, 250 horsepower, the stronger one, 350 horsepower. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Lexus LM completely different driving lounge here today with this MPV and the first thing that comes to your mind when just starting this vehicle here it feels astonishingly normal passenger car alike and there you feel this passenger car platform also with the same hybrid system as well so I lift my foot off the throttle EV mode this small green symbol goes on then I'm just all electric here and when I'm using a little bit more throttle here at the moment still some throttle 
now the more than the engine goes on again typical Toyota hybrid system and you also have different driving modes at the moment here in the normal mode or the rear comfort drive mode we'll test that one later when I'm being chauffeured by Leah she will be so kind <laughs> <laughs> then actually the the rear vibrations and so on everything is set out and they have most comfort in the rear and here in the sport mode everything is you know, more set on attack here also the throttle input and so on and when we're here now at 60 kilometers an hour let's accelerate some out let's go so 80 100 so it was you know, it's like 60 to 100 i mean you hear the engine noise predominantly yes this is typical ecvt effect you have here it's not as bad as it was be you know like in very early models or something but still it doesn't feel really sporty so in the sport mode a lot of different parameters are changed but let's also see if we can really feel that it is set yeah first of all th uh, throttle input is changed let's see here steering difference sport mode to normal mode yeah, it's a little bit lighter, so in the sport mode then a little bit more feedback. And it's also said that the suspension is supposed to change here in the sport mode. Here at the moment it's pretty even everything the road. Do we feel anything of that? Let's see about the body roll. Of course it's still not in sporty suspension in this case. Drive normal. Yeah, you see, <laughs> she's just sliding around pretty much on these animal skin seats, so they don't offer so much support then. Would you say it was a difference, normal mode? Was it shaking much more? A little, little bit, yeah. yeah. So I think sport mode, yeah. yeah, maybe a little bit. But it's not that you would feel it would be a completely different vehicle or something. Um, yeah, so most of the time probably you would always leave it in the, in the normal driving mode and then just relax this silence here. 100 kilometers now or 60 miles now approximately and feels super effortless and usually when you're driving these MPVs it's always very loud and you feel like you know kind of noisy yeah they have this cool upright driving position and they're a lot of fun and have a lot of character but they hardly convey this true luxury experience but here they work a lot with passive noise cancellation and active noise cancellation and you do feel that now 120 kilometers an hour, like 70 miles an hour approximately. And it is super, super silent in here. About the active noise cancellation, I'm not always the biggest fan of that. Here they try to do it in a more subtle way because when you have too much active noise, Emma, no, I think I have to go to so next one. So when you have too much active noise cancellation, you might feel like, oh, there's like, like a vacuum next to your ear. Here, I think they found a balance. To me personally, in this topic, I'm kind of sensitive. I, I hear that a lot. So I feel like just a slight tone of vacuum, but talked to Leah earlier about that. And she said, you know, you don't feel that. No, she, so she's fine with that. And she can hear and see definitely better than me. So yeah, <laughs> she's definitely, and also smell better than me. So uh, actually her senses are more up to date than mine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, probably I've already experienced too much in my life, so um, yeah, the senses go down at some point. Um, yeah, but but still, so I feel like a little bit vacuum effect from this active noise cancellation, but not too bad. It would be super unpleasant. She's fine with that. And the overall result is really that you have a passenger car feeling. It is just as you would be driving a luxury S Lexus SUV, with the difference that you have this, you know, huge huge space there in the front and that of course gives you this MPV feeling but the only MPV feeling you really get is more from this layout of the vehicle you know you the things you obviously see from the other things you feel and hear and experience in this luxury or premium sense it is really almost I would say the least MPV feeling I have felt so far in an MPV and that's a very very astonishing thing to achieve now on the motorway and also when we you know, had the recuperation a little bit, we got some more energy into the battery and now I can drive in the all EV mode once again. This 2.4 turbo hybrid by the way, the stronger one, 
available, as I said, in different markets like Japan and China. Uh, this one, you have the 2.5, which sounds more powerful, but it's less powerful. So this one, 250 horsepower, the strong one, 350 horsepower system output. But this one, I think, is enough for the vehicle. The other one, maybe when you're like, you have the seven seat and you really drive with seven people, maybe that, but usually this engine will be actually enough. It's also used in other uh, Lexus vehicles. And at the end of our driving cycle, we can also tell you more about the concise fuel economy, which is usually, as we know from Toyota and Lexus, actually uh, pretty good. So steering feeling is overall actually quite light, as I said in the sport with a little bit more resistance, but you have no dead zone area. It is meant more for running straight, but you have a good feeling overall for the vehicle. The only thing this is maybe you're know, getting used to, you cannot do like a good shoulder view, especially in that interesting, I don't know, maybe, is that usual? Maybe our Polish friends can help us. Yes, yeah, of course, also the, the country of my names, my, my surname's origin. Um, yeah, but that was a couple of generations ago. But maybe our Polish fans can help us if uh, speeding in Poland is a thing or if it's, you know, like, are there strict traffic laws? Should I obey the law like, like in Sweden or something? Or in, uh, where it's really, really strict, even one kilometer an hour plus? Or is it more like, you know, whatever, drive like you, like you want? Um, yeah, looking forward to these comments there, definitely. Um, here, once again, lift my foot off throttle, recuperation, EV mode. And this electric moment always also fits to the whole smoothness of the vehicle. That's pretty cool, definitely. So yeah, I'm still astonished how you know, how little this feels MPV. Yeah, just as I said here, the shoulder view, I, I can't see anything. So I have to rely on the, on the large side mirror. There's also the blind spot monitor feature included here. And that is also super necessary because that protects you again, you know, against anything that you can't see when you're turning left or right or so. And also very important here, this top mirror, see through the digital camera there, and that is super helpful because when I use it in a normal way, it's like you watch through the glass then, and then there's reflections. I mean, if the glass would be down, then I could see something in the rear, but then there are like the huge second row seats. So definitely in this case, better to have the digital mirror and really see the camera image. And now let's put it to the sport mode and let's hit this corner here. Some roll, but not too much. Accelerating out. Wow. It really feels astonishingly sporty considering, you know, so you don't feel that you would be driving a heavy vehicle. And remember, this one here is at 2.9 tons, so almost three tons of weight I'm moving here. And you really don't feel that, you know, a little bit more uneven ground. Still, although we have the larger 19 inch wheels here, suspension is evening that out very well, even here in that sport mode. So overall, I'm really impressed by the whole driving feeling. So relaxed and silent at the same time. It doesn't feel bulky or heavy. So that's really astonishing that they that they managed that here and then as we are always when you see like signs like these it's always great for a car and feel this of course so still in the sport mode 60 kilometers 70 kilometers an hour wow it's actually fun to drive this one suspension even the sport mode is evening it out very well and i don't feel that i would need to slow down so much or so you know just in case see of course now the weight is pushing us out a little bit but ooh, nice here you hear that sound from the ECVT of course that's not super pleasant but the whole you know chassis feel and body roll is not really that extreme wow the beautiful road so wouldn't ex interesting yeah I mean there's no pavement here uh, interesting that you can really have fun driving this one so how's it to the passenger when you know when I'm driving a little bit faster now it's okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah because that's always a good, a good measure um, you know when you're getting sick as a passenger or something then something is off as for g-force and so on and then of course they they try to manage at least to reduce g-force and vibration especially for the rear passengers but does that work shall we switch
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have switched. Lia is driving me now. Thank you so much <laughs> already. First of all, as for the fuel economy, that was also missing. We can score some six liters on one kilometer, so 39 MBG US, 47 MBG UK. And when you're sitting here in the rear, it is really a completely different feeling than we've compared to this luxury sedan style. You sit so upright, you more have the feeling you're sitting on a chair at home, actually. Of course, you feel that you're moving, yeah, or maybe like in this plane seat, but definitely this does not feel anything car-like in the rear when you're driving. And I was afraid at first that the G-forces might be a little bit too much because you sit higher than in a low-sitting sedan, but that's definitely not bad at all. By the way, here this window, if it's up or down, you can also put it up, it doesn't do much as for the noise, so it's not louder with the window down. In general, it's very silent, and also when someone is speaking in the front, you can hardly hear that, actually. So then you always have to, like, can, can you speak up? Then I, then I can actually hear you. Um, yeah, of course I can always, you know, close and open the shades from here, everything also while driving, also the side shade. So very easy and straightforward controls, actually. And there are also the different driving modes. So at the moment we're in normal driving mode. Now Leah can switch to the rear comfort driving mode. There we go, yeah, <laughs> she, she got it. And this is supposed to reduce the vibrations in the rear, especially. And I mean, here in the road, there are some bumps in there. Do I feel any difference? Mm. I mean, it is it's fairly comfortable overall, or suspension-wise. Can you do now some, some slant, like a little bit right and left? Okay, rear comfort. Woo! Yeah, she <laughs> she's into racing, right? Now go to the uh, normal mode again. There we go. Wow, oh, that's a difference. Indeed. Hmm, interesting. So, especially when you go slalom, like right and left, you let the car tilt, then the rear comfort mode keeps the car more upright and the G-forces are being reduced. That's the main thing you do actually realize when, when switching that mode. And of course, what about the flat down seats here? So, yeah, I said, it's not good that I don't have like a single hotkey for that. And also I cannot do that simultaneously. So when I put down this one here to the rear and I want to put the legs up simultaneously, that doesn't work. So I have to put this one all the way to the back first. And then I have to go there with the legs. Yeah, take some time and it's also not that comfortable to do it now. And here then I have to reach over and do it with the legs. And yeah, I was really looking forward. How is it? In driving, especially when I'm then in this whoa <laughs> bad position, uh, now I can't see anything from the road. I can see just something in the sky and so on. And wow, that's super unusual. Um, yeah, I mean, when the road is not that even, it feels super weirdo. Um, but I mean, just think about you take a nap now and you wake up when when the journey is done or something. Um, yeah, I also have to recheck with the uh, with the engineers what about the, the crash safety test then here in this case. But actually, that works. And you also don't slide that much like forward like you do in the Mercedes V-Class in this executive um, thing. But when the road is a little bit bumpy, then it's kind of weirdo when you're, you know, uh, like this in this position. Um, some of you might remember, so when, when I was a kid, um, there was sometimes even no seat belt in the rear of the vehicles and it was, you know, that was legal actually. And sometimes, you know, when you were going on holiday, you were actually sleeping on the rear bench, maybe even without a seat belt. And, you know, just like, like this, you know, in a, a horizontal way. Or sometimes um, mom would actually build up like everything in the ground floor that you have an even floor in the, in the rear seats of the vehicle. You know, like the foot area and the seating area and then you would just lay down there as a kid and uh, stand up again uh, when the journey was done. So um, yeah, this is maybe something <laughs> I remember now when being in, in this position in here. But yeah, actually the big question was, is it more comfortable, especially in the rear than like a Mercedes S-Class and so on while driving? 
It is something very different. It is also a matter of preference if you rather think you feel at home when you're in this typical low seating sedan position. It definitely works and not necessarily the flat down position, but even just this sitting upright here and this very roomish, roomish spacious feeling that kind of leaves you very relaxed and you also have the feeling um, it's you know cool for conversation and also for working. So I guess, especially like for this uh, working argument, this might actually be the better solution as for sitting upright and having just more room. This could also be like a like a conference room or something. But if you want to compare it now to the Mercedes S-Class or the V-Class in the executive version, see you there.